Okay, so this is joint work with Pierre Neron, Andrew Tolnik, and Ilko Visser, and both Ilko and I are here today. In this talk, we present a new and unifying approach to modeling binding and memory and semantic specifications. We call this approach Scopes Describe Frames. So why are we interested in modeling binding and memory and semantic specifications? Well, in an ideal world, language designers write down the semantics of their language once and for all, and this specification acts both as a source of documentation, but also as a source for deriving tools from the specifications. Tools such as IDEs, type checkers, language runtimes with garbage collectors, and uh, proof assistant infrastructure. The specification also supports reasoning about the specification, um, so and proving properties such as type soundness and the soundness of garbage collection strategies. And for statically bound languages, which is the class of languages that we'll be focusing on in this talk, binding is important for both the static semantics and for uh, dynamic semantics. So how is binding modeled in uh, traditional semantic specifications? Well, in a number of different ways. So here's a simple example with lexical scoping. And the way that we typically model uh, the semantics of binding in static semantics is by associating names with types. For example, using typing contexts or type substitutions. And the way that we model binding in dynamic semantics is by associating names with values, for example, using substitution environments, de Brown indices, or higher order abstract syntax. If we turn our attention to mutable states, then uh, once again, we typically model static name binding by associating names with types or possibly by associating memory locations with types. And for the dynamic semantics, uh, Binding is modeled by tracking the state of the memory, for example, using stores and heaps in semantic specifications. And if we have objects around, then in order to give uh, semantics to binding in the static semantics, we use class tables that record which fields classes bind. And at runtime, objects are typically represented as special kinds of values that have uh, mutable fields that track the state of, um, of fields in, in the object. So all of these concepts are modeled in essentially different ways in semantic specifications. But are these concepts really different? Or is there a common way of modeling all of these concepts in a uniform model? In this talk, we propose that there is. So we propose using scope graphs for, doing, uh, for modeling static semantics of binding and using frames for the dynamic semantics of binding, where a frame is essentially a generalization of the familiar notion of a stack frame. Scope graphs were introduced at last year's ESOP, and uh, in this paper that, we, that I'm presenting here, uh, we propose to use frames for structuring uh, memory and doing modeling the dynamic semantics of binding. But before diving into frames, let's first recall how scope graphs work. The idea is that we associate scopes with AST nodes. So here's a simple example with two scopes. In the first scope, we have a single declaration for x. And the second scope, which is a lexical child of the first scope, denoted by this ph in the graph, we have a declaration and a reference. In order to resolve this graph, we construct a path from each reference in the graph to its corresponding declaration. So for example, in this graph, we can construct this path, which means that x resolves in our uh, program. Now, the details of how to actually construct this graph were described in previous work, uh, both how to do it declaratively in the ESOP paper uh, and how to do it using constraint solving in the PEPM paper from this year. Scope graphs also model uh, more interesting binding patterns. So here is an example with classes and class-based inheritance. We have two classes, A and B, where B extends A, and by extending A, all of the fields that are defined in the class A become visible inside scope of the class B. We model this in the scope graphs uh, by associating a scope with each of the two declarations that define our two classes. So here we have two scopes. And uh, model, we model inheritance by having an import between uh, the two scopes that define the two classes. And now we can resolve the x variable that occurs inside the body of the B class to the x declaration uh, that 
is in the parent class by this path in the graph. Scope graphs scale to a wide range of different binding patterns, uh, including shadowing, Java packages, imports, qualified names, C-sharp namespaces and partial classes, and uh, transitive and non-transitive imports. And all of these are described in the ESOP paper. So returning to our bigger, level, uh, big, bigger picture, we uh, see how scope graphs provide a uniform way of describing all of these uh, binding concepts uh, for static semantics. The key difference from how uh, we traditionally model binding in semantic specifications is that whereas traditional approaches associate names with types, scope graphs model name binding by associating named references with name declarations uh, by constructing resolution paths in scope graphs. This doesn't preclude dealing with type checking, as we will see later in this talk, but for now, let's focus on memory. So what we propose is to use frames for structuring runtime memory. Where, uh, so what is a frame? Well, a frame consists of a set of slots that bind names to values. And it records a set of links that links a frame to other frames. It also records which scope it instantiates or which scope describes the frame where we say that a scope describes a frame when for each declaration in the scope, sorry, yeah, for each declaration in the scope, yes, um, there is a corresponding slot in the frame, and for each outgoing edge of the scope, there is a corresponding outgoing link of the frame. And the key idea here is that we structure memory such that it follows the structure of the scope graph, such that we can use static resolution paths for doing uh, variable lookups at runtime. So let's have a look at how we can actually uh, structure, how we can actually use this approach to, to structure memory. So here is our simple example from before in the scope graph. When we start evaluating this program, we enter a new scope. And when we enter a new scope, we allocate a frame that is described by the scope that we are entering. So here we have a single declaration, sorry, a single slot for the single declaration in the scope that we are instantiating. We initialize the slot of this scope. And proceeding, we enter a new scope, so we allocate a new frame, which once again is described by the scope that we are entering. So it's linked to its lexical parent frame, just as the scope that we're instantiating is linked to its lexical parent scope. And what happens next is that we're going to be dereferencing X, and here we can use the static resolution path uh, to dereference X by traversing the frame structure using the path which looks up the, ver the value of x in the parent, uh, parent frame, making this the final state of the heap. A single scope may have multiple frames instantiating it at runtime, which is useful for modeling, for example, recursive functions. So here is a simple recursive function, namely the factorial function. And its scope graph is uh, in the bottom left of the slide. So when we evaluate this program, well, we enter a new scope, so we allocate a frame, we initialize the slot of this frame to bind uh, the function that we're defining, and we call the function. And when we call the function, we enter the function scope, which allocates a new call frame, or a stack frame, if you will, or activation record. Um, so this is how a frame is really just a generalized notion of a, of a stack frame. So it also corresponds uh, exactly to the scope that describes the uh, function, so it has a single slot for the single declaration that the scope defines. Proceeding with evaluation, we can now use, uh, we can now evaluate the body of the function where we, again, dereference each of the variables that occur in the function by using the static resolution paths for each of the references in the scope graph to do uh, the, the lookup at runtime. So, proceeding with evaluation, uh, evaluating the body causes a new rec recursive call, so we allocate a new call frame, so that we now have two frames that instantiate the same scope. Uh, important is that for each of the frames that are in our heap at this uh, point in time, they're all described by the corresponding scope in the scope graph, which means that when we evaluate the body of the function once again, we can still use the static resolution paths for doing uh, lookups at runtime. 
So the result of evaluating the, the body of the function is a final recursive call, which makes this the final state of the heap. So frames can be used to model uh, lexical scoping and function calls, and it does so by modeling everything as memory. Uh, this provides us with a uniform way of doing name resolution, both uh, in static semantics and at runtime. But what about objects? Well, objects also fall into this pattern. So here is a simple class and its use, and a scope graph in the bottom of the slide. When we evaluate this program, or when we enter a new scope, we allocate a new frame. What happens next is we're going to be instantiating a new instance of a class, sorry, yeah, a new object that instantiates the class A. And how do we rep represent this? Well, it is also just a frame. And in particular, it's a frame that is described by the scope uh, that defines the class. So it has a slot for each of the declarations that are in the class scope that defines the structure of the class. So frames can be used to model uh, both lexical scoping, function calls, objects, structured memory objects, um, and it provides a uniform way of modeling all of these concepts that are traditionally modeled in different ways in semantic specifications. So a key characteristic of our approach is that we model memory at a concrete level that roughly corresponds to how realistic language runtimes actually structure memory. So why has no one done this before? Why? Um, What's, what's the key new ingredient here? Well, the key new ingredient here is uh, the scope graph. By structuring memory such that it follows the structure of the scope graph, we can use static resolution paths for doing uh, lookups at runtime, such that we have strong static guarantees that these lookups are guaranteed to succeed and also yield something that is actually uh, well typed. So this is not only elegant, it's also very useful for verification. So let's consider more formally what it means for a scope to describe a frame. So we've actually already seen this, and what we've seen is what we call the well-bound frame invariant. So the well-bound frame invariant says that a scope uh, is, describes a frame when it recalls that it instantiates that frame, and for each declaration there is a corresponding slot in the frame, and for each outgoing edge of the scope there is a corresponding outgoing link of the frame such that the targets of scope, uh, scope edges and the target of frame links match up. So this gives us that the structure of frames follows the structure of the scope graph. But if we're also interested in uh, proving the absence of type errors, we also need to check that names are consistently typed. So we introduce the wall type frame invariant, which says that when we associate uh, types with each declaration in the scope graph, and we say that a frame is well typed when each slot value recorded in frames are typed by the types of um, the, declar the corresponding declarations. Together, these two invariants form what we call the good frame invariant. So the good frame invariant just says that a frame is good when it is well bound and well typed. And applying this invariant to an entire heap uh, we say that a heap is good or a heap satisfies the good heap invariant when every frame in the heap is well bound and well typed. For heaps that satisfy this property, we can prove once and for all a language independent lemma that says that taking any static resolution path that is an actual path in the graph and applying this at runtime, we are guaranteed to yield a slot that has actually, actually exists in a frame at runtime and um, produce a value. So look up the value in that slot, uh, which is also well typed. So it essentially gives us a way of proving type soundness for all memory related operations. So how do we structure uh, specifications using this approach? Well, um, using this approach, we get essentially a language independent part of our specification which is the scope graph. So scope graphs define how uh, define the semantics of doing name resolution. Uh, and we propose that language specifiers should specify uh, what it means for a program to be well bound and well typed. 
So well boundness essentially defines what the structure of um, the scope graph should be and how it relates to the AST of programs. Well tightness checks that the program is well tight, where once again we use the scope graph for checking what the types of variables are in the program. For specifying the dynamic semantics, we propose that uh, everything, all memory related operations should be specified using frames and heaps. And we provide a language independent API for low level memory operations that uh, dynamic semantics can use to interact uh, with memory. And by providing this API of low level memory operations, we can prove once and for all a series of language independent lemmas that prove when these memory invariants that I summarized on the previous slides are actually uh, satisfied, such that uh, all of these language independent lemmas uh, provide a lot of structure to type soundness proofs. Essentially, all memory related operations in type soundness proofs follow from language independent lemmas. Right, so how do we actually prove type soundness? Well, the key uh, property of type soundness proofs become ensuring that the, the good heap invariant is preserved when we do evaluation. So if we start evaluation in a good heap, uh, evaluation should preserve the good heap property, which provides us with a guarantee that we can do reference variables and yield something that is well typed. And this property largely follows from language independent lemmas, which is a really nice property. Another nice property is that we can formulate a language independent lemma about when garbage collection is safe. Uh, we can formulate what it means uh, what it means for frames to be garbage. So the language independent lemma that we can prove is that if we are given a good heap consisting of two parts A and B, and the B part of the heap becomes unreferenced then we can garbage collect B and still preserve the goodness of A. And by preserving the goodness of A, this implies that we haven't introduced any memory errors and that we essentially preserve type soundness. So in our paper, we have proofs uh, that this language independent lemma about garbage collection preserving the good heap property essentially is refined by the well-known uh, garbage collection strategies, reference counting, and copying or mark or sweep um, garbage collectors. In order to showcase our approach, we've been applying it to three example languages. Um, so these languages have both functional features and object-oriented features, including classes, uh, inheritance, and subtyping. They're available at the URL at the bottom of the slide, and everything has been implemented in COC. And in particular, we have formalized uh, language-independent lemmas for um, well, language-independent formalizations of scopes and frames and the language-independent lemmas about correspondences between these. Work in progress is implementing support for uh, deriving from specifications using scope graphs and frame heaps, uh, tools such as IDEs, type checkers, length runtimes, garbage, with garbage collectors, uh, as well as proof assistant infrastructure and implementing this in the language designers workbench Spoofax. Uh, what we'd like to explore in future work is the extent to which we can generate not only proof assistant infrastructure, but actually full type soundness proofs, uh, since the structure of our proofs are so regular and largely follow from language independent lemmas. Uh, this suggests that there's uh, a lot of potential for automation uh, using this approach. So, in summary, Scopes Describe Frames provides a new approach to modeling binding and memory in semantic specifications. A key characteristic of the approach is that it models memory at a concrete level that roughly corresponds to how realistic language runtimes actually structure memory. We get away with this in a very elegant way by structuring memory using uh, frames and heaps that correspond to scopes and scope graphs. By doing so, we can prove once and for all language independent lemmas about, uh, this, about the soundness of applying static resolution paths between dynamic lookups and uh, providing guarantees that this is 
this actually yields a, well, a well-typed value. These language-independent lemmas provide structure to type soundness proofs and to proofs about the soundness of garbage collection strategies. The scope graphs are blueprints for how to lay out memory at runtime. Thanks for listening. Uh, very nice work. Uh, I really like this idea of separating out the language independent stuff from the language dependent stuff. Um, exactly how good that is depends on the percentage. And so in these case studies, what was the percentage of the proof work that became language independent versus the stuff that's still language dependent, right? So if I'm using your tool, I, I want to know just, are we talking 5% or 95 or what? somewhere in the middle? Yeah. You, can, you can count that, right? You've got the proofs. We've got the proofs, and uh, I, I could load up the cocktail. Go, go count them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is so important information. Yes. Uh, so we haven't counted it, but all of our proofs uh, are essentially, uh, well, the most complicated ones are apply this lemma and uh, well, do case, case distinction on, on the facts that follow from this lemma. Um, with regard to garbage collection, um, uh, in a language with, let's say, lexical closures, uh, let's say there's a lexical scope with variables uh, x, y, and z, and uh, within that lexical scope, uh, there's a closure that captures x, and there's another closure that captures y, and there's no closure that captures z. Then uh, the frame with the x, y, and z uh, um, itself is, is not live except for the fact that it's that um, there's these two descending closures. So the two descending closures remain live uh, within this representation, if I understand it. Um, the frame containing X, Y, and Z would remain live, and therefore the garbage the model of garbage collection would state unambiguously that Z remains reachable and therefore cannot be garbage collected. Uh, is that correct? Uh, if I was able to follow your... I can draw a diagram. Can I draw a diagram? Is there any way to place to draw something? <laughs> so you're saying you have a closure with those three variables in them? And well, no. They're, they're, they're closure defined in a scope that had those three variables but only X and Y are captured by the closures. There's no, the, no closure within that scope mentions Z freely. Yeah, that's right, so, but they are in, so Z is reachable, Z but it's, is, not, it's not actually used. It's yeah. re reachable in the sense that had a closure mentioned the name Z, it would mean that Z, but it's statically the case that none of those closures mention Z freely, and therefore uh, yes, uh, yes, many... Yes, yes. so in, in the current approach, we would, we would hold on to that. Uh, that would be part of the closure, because we, okay. the closure is basically a reference, a frame pointer to the... Uh, yeah. And so one of the interesting things that we can do is consider that kind of optimization, where you see, well, uh, you do hold on to that, uh, to, to, that uh, to, to everything that's reachable, but actually you're only going to ever... Uh, uh, access things that you mention in the in, in the body of the function, so you can uh, you could make uh, a series of frames that 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 cuts out that uh, those unused variables. So these kinds of optimizations, I think we can study in a more generic okay. uh, manner in this uh, in, in this framework. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I'm particularly interested in this kind of issue is that uh, one of the things that's been a black hole in um, in language semantics are operations that make garbage collection visible, in particular trying to give a semantics to uh, weak references. Oh, okay, yeah. That would be interesting too. What happens if the scope graph changes? What happens if the scope graph changes? 
for example, if you add or delete slots at runtime? Yeah, so that's uh, that wouldn't be that wouldn't fall into this model uh, where we have statically bound uh, scopes. Um, but yeah, maybe that's a feature to consider for future work. Okay, so I think it's interesting that this model matches very precisely with the static analysis that was used in the language beta all the way back to 78, 1978. So these frames would correspond to both uh, activation records and objects. So there are a lot of things there that are actually quite similar. But one thing that wouldn't work in that context is if you extend to a context where you do not know statically what the declaration is that you're looking up. So for instance, in the language Dart, if you're implementing a class, then there's no static connection uh, between... It's a static, it's statically typed, but it's also, it also has a, a dynamic capability of running with, when uh, you do not satisfy the typing constraint until you hit a runtime test that will say that you can't assign this to that variable item. But if you have no connection, so you don't have a statically known path in your scope graph that will be uh, replicated precisely in your frames. I, I, I suspect that there would be a case that you cannot cover there. But because it's... Yeah. Yeah. At least, uh, yeah, so the static guarantee isn't there. So we would have to do a dynamic uh, search for the slot, I think. So echo my answer also, and then we're done. I think Casper. Yeah, yeah, so so we really relying in, in this approach on uh, on typing. So we, we we need class types and we do resolve field accesses uh, through class types. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And otherwise, it becomes a more dynamic uh, resolution story, and that, that will be a variation that, that will be interesting to to investigate. But that's not covered by this approach. Let's thank Casper and come and ask. Questions.